Welcome to this video, which is the first in a series of short videos on research design. Whilst important, the concept of research design is a little slippery and ill-defined, and is used differently by different scholars, which is one of the topics which we'll be exploring in this video. When it comes to defining research design, like most things in research, this is a little trickier than you might initially think. This is because different scholars often use different words for the same or similar things. This comes from different scholars using different research approaches and coming from different disciplines where there might be a history or a legacy of using a particular word. Wilson defined a research design as a detailed framework or plan that helps to guide you through the research process, allowing a greater likelihood of achieving your research objectives. Now it's possible to see from this definition of research design that it's quite wide and focuses more on what they do rather than what they include. And ultimately this is relatively understandable given that there are so many potential research designs and because there are so many different research designs that can be selected they're all a bit different and therefore change the language about how we would refer to them and what they can actually do and offer. For example some research designs prescribe and guide the user more in the terms of the methods used or the way in which the data should be analysed, whereas others are much more flexible and open. And we'll come on to this in greater detail shortly. I'm sure many of you will already be familiar with Saunders Research Onion, as it's a figure which is becoming increasingly seminal, particularly within the business research methods literature. Now in Saunders Research Onion, what I am terming research designs is called strategy. So starting on the outside of the research onion, we have philosophies and approaches, and these are your more methodological decisions. And then what Saunders terms strategies, and I'm calling research design in these videos, is the third layer in. And at this stage, the decisions start to have more of an impact on the research methods you will use to collect your data. And this is why often the research onion from this stage is depicted in a different shade of colour because these are the more practical decisions that you need to make. Now whilst I'm using the term research design and Saunders is using the term strategies, these terms are often blended and sometimes used interchangeably. So for example, there's a definition here which suggests the research design refers to the overall strategy that you choose to integrate the different components of the study. Now if we look at another definition, but this time the definition of a case study, which is a research design, which we're going to be covering in more detail in a separate video, we can see that Croetel defines a case study as a research approach that is used to generate an in-depth, multifaceted understanding of a complex issue in its real life context. It is an established research design that is used extensively in a wide variety of disciplines, particularly in the social sciences. So we can see from this definition and the last definition that within the literature, a case study, which is a type of research design, can potentially be termed as a design, a strategy or an approach. This can make reading around research design a little challenging as people can use different terms for the same thing, or they can use terms interchangeably, and as we've seen, even in the same sentence. Personally, I prefer the term design, so that's what I've chosen to use in these videos. 
But it's really important to be aware that it's common for different terms to be used. So make sure you have a robust understanding about what they're talking about when you're reading in this area. When it comes to viewing and defining a research design, I like to view it like a wrapper which should align with your chosen research philosophy and it helps to inform your practical research decisions, such as your sampling data collection and analysis methods. So it really helps to bring everything together. You're starting with those philosophical decisions and your research approach. You then need to ensure that you're selecting a research design which supports the assumptions within those philosophies and approaches. And then you need to select the right sample, the right kind of data collection methods and analyze your data in a way which is appropriate within that research design. So this moves us on nicely to the next part of the video, which is about the importance of research design. Now research designs are important as they act as a link between the theoretical methodological decisions you make within your research project and the more practical data collection decisions. Research designs align with a different research philosophy or different research philosophies. As some research designs align more tightly with a specific research philosophy, whilst others can potentially align with several research philosophies. Now it's really important that we understand how different research designs link with different research philosophies due to the assumptions and beliefs they have within them or underpinning them. Research design also works the other way, looking into the onion at these more practical research decisions. So for example, a research design might influence the type of methods chosen and also the number of methods that we might choose. Now, one thing that we see is some research designs are more prescriptive in terms of methods. So for example, some research designs might propose we only use one method or one type of method, such as only using quantitative methods or only using qualitative methods. Whereas other research designs will put forward that actually we need multiple methods. So this is where and how different research designs influence the practical data collection decisions we make. The research design selected also potentially could have implications for your sampling decisions as different research designs can be interested in the size of the sample or potentially the makeup of the sample. So for example, they might want a sample made up of people who have different perspectives of the phenomenon you're researching. And some research designs, such as Q methodology, which is another one we'll discuss in this series of videos, also prescribe the data analysis process and method. So not only do they detail how you will collect the data, but also how you will analyze it. As different research designs have different implications for your research, it's important to decide and understand your research design fully before moving on to the next stages of selecting your data collection methods and also deciding upon your sample and who you're going to collect data from. So to conclude, it's important to understand the different research designs, how they align with different research philosophies and the potential implications for sampling, data collection and analysis. Some research designs give more or less scope for selecting methods and philosophies. So if selecting a research design with more scope, it's really important to be able to justify those decisions of how you're going to collect your data and which philosophy you're using. Plus, it's important to be able to justify how a given research design 
can achieve your research aim and answer your research questions, as ultimately this should be your driving decision when selecting a research design. How and why is it appropriate to achieve my research aim and answer the research question set? So coming up, we have a series of videos about different research designs and what the implications of selecting each of these research designs are for your research. 